Shall we kick off then? Eliza, yeah. thanks everybody so much for coming. Um, uh, I'm Ruth Hughes, I'm Barrister at Firestone Buildings and uh, I'm going to be asking questions on the subject of common intention constructive trust to Eliza Eagling. She's also a Barrister at Firestone Buildings. She's got a uh, broad chancery practice including uh, contentious trusts, uh, contentious probate. She's been in the um, Court of Appeal case of Cowan, which has been a very interesting on uh, standstill agreements, and she also has a contentious court protection practice. Um, so I'm going to start off by asking Eliza, in the context of a common intention constructive trusts, uh, is there any relevant legislation in this area? Well, it depends on who you are, Ruth. I mean, if you are a divorcing married couple, then obviously there's the Matrimonial Causes Act 1973, where the court has wide distributive powers. Um, if you're dead and you were cohabiting, then your surviving partner can obviously claim under the 1975 Act. And at the moment, there is a bill um, going through Parliament. It's had its first reading in the House of Lords on the 6th of February, and that's the Cohabitation Rights Bill. Uh, but don't hold your breath because it's actually been around for some time and it's based on a 2007 Law Commission report. Um, so it's right, isn't it, that it doesn't have uh, governmental support. No, no, it's got no, no governmental support. The Daily Mail has made sure of that. So um, the I was looking actually, when I was preparing this talk about how many cohabitants there are. And as of November 2019, there were 3.5 million cohabiting couples. I mean, I'm not sure if that's gone up, maybe, due to the lockdown, everyone's moved in, or perhaps it's gone down now because everyone's fed up. So uh, it'd be interesting to see. But obviously, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a social issue. You know, personally, I think there should be some legislation. But at the moment, the position is, as per Stack and Dowden in 2007, where Lady Hale said that uh, for intervivos disputes between unmarried cohabiting couples, it's, they're still governed by what she called the ordinary law. So that's really the common law, yes, uh, exactly. isn't it, Eliza? So um, what then is uh, a uh, common intention constructive trust? Well, there's a recent decision of last year of Lord Justice Henderson in Carmen and Harrison Morgan. And I'm going to borrow his definition because I think it's quite good. He says, the trust is properly described as a constructive one, operating on the conscience of Mr Hawkins, so there's no formal declaration of trust of the freehold that was ever executed. And there's a quick reminder from the law conversion, or in your case, Ruth, the uh, law degree, uh, section 53.1b of the Law of Property Act 1925 requires a declaration of trust respecting the land to be manifested in writing. So that's what um, Henderson's getting at there. Um, if we did have that manifest in writing, then we wouldn't need a constructive trust at all. So what's the common intention bit? Well, he says this may be described as a common intention constructive trust because its contents reflect the common intention express or inferred of the party. So there we go. It does what it says on the tin. End of talk. Yeah, it just struck me that I should have said that we are recording this webinar and that there will be a question and answer session at the end. So please do put your question and uh, questions in the box. And if you want to remain anonymous, you can do so. Uh, so we won't reveal your identity uh, in the Q&A. Um, but back to questions uh, for Eliza posed by me. Uh, in Stack, Lady Hale referred to unmarried marriage cohabiting couples. Are they the only people that can bring common intention constructive trust? claims? Well there's certainly some of the people and, and the term that has been used in some of the cases is, is those in an intimate personal relationship because I suppose cohabiting couples you know, could be used by some people to mean say siblings who are cohabiting. So the classic strand of the common intention constructive trust is with that intimate personal relationship and that's what we saw in Stack and Dowden, James and Colonel, Mar and Collie the classic but you can also get you can get siblings you can get parent child relationship i mean some of the language in stack talks about as i said cohabiting couples who um share a home together so that could be friends colleagues maybe ruth um and also um in Bizarre and patel i mean most of you will know that as the 75 act claim but no way, weren't you, Eliza? Yes, yes. I, well, I represented D6. So he dropped out of the picture by the time we got to the 75 Act, but he was in round one. And um, D6 was Mrs. Bazzati's uh, child from her relationship with the deceased. 
Um, Mrs. Bazzati, supported by D6, um, her son, tried to argue that there was a common intentional constructive trust, not one that arose whilst the deceased was alive, but one that actually was formed after his death. Because the, uh, the estate went unadministered for 28 years, and uh, my client and his mother lived in the property. And interestingly, Chief Master Marsh said that whilst it wasn't made out on our facts, there's no reason in principle, he said, why a person in the claimant's position, Mrs. Bazzati, could not show that the estate or an asset in it was held on the basis of a common intention constructive trust, at least on conventional principles that relied upon an agreement, whether oral or written. He went on to say that he didn't think the sort of an analysis of inferring an intention based on conduct was suitable for intestacy beneficiaries, or at least not these intestacy beneficiaries. But I'll come back to that theme. Um, my connection is a little bit unstable, so I'm sorry if I cut out a little bit. Um, can you explain what the basic framework of a common intention constructive trust is, Eliza? Yeah, well, there are a number of ways of, sort of dividing this up. And one of the ways that I find useful is, first of all, to break the cases down into sole name case or a joint name case. And Stack and Dowden gives us some helpful starting points. It tells us that equity follows the law. Well, what does that mean? It means in the case of sole ownership, so Ruth, with your house, you're the sole legal owner, you'd have 100% of the beneficial ownership. So the, the beneficial title is reflecting the legal title. And in a joint name case, the presumption is a um, beneficial joint tenancy. And it's stack at paragraph 58 that tells us that it's beneficial joint tenancy and not tenancy in common. And Stack also tells us that the onus is on the person seeking to show that the beneficial ownership is different from the legal ownership, which of course makes a lot of sense. And I think there are actually two main elements to common intention constructive trust claim, and that applies to both a sole name case and a joint name case. And that is you've got to have the common intention, of course, as, as Henderson told us, but also you've got to show detrimental reliance. I think there was a period after um, Stack and Dowden and Jones and Kerner, where you know some people were suggesting that um, detrimental reliance had been abolished by those cases, um, but I think it, it's really it's just that they were it wasn't an issue. And for example, in the Court of Appeal case of Curran and Collins, um, it was made absolutely clear. Look, you know you can see in the co comments of Lord Justice Lewison. Uh, that detrimental reliance is a fundamental feature of these cases. And he actually said that one of the counsel had in her skeleton argument tried to run the argument that detrimental reliance had been abolished, but he said she'd rightly abandoned it by the time we got to the oral hearing. So, um, you know, and I think it's a key feature and it's actually the detrimental reliance that means it would be unconscionable for one party to resile from what would otherwise be an unenforceable agreement. So um, how do you show the first element, the common intention, Eliza? Well, there is a mantra um, from the House of Lords in Stack, which was the search is to ascertain the party's shared intentions, actual, inferred or imputed with respect to the property in light of the whole course of conduct in relation to it. I think it's fair to say that this caused quite a deal of confusion, sort of muddying together the um, express, inferred and imputed all in one without really breaking it down. And that was actually acknowledged in Jones and Kernot as being having caused confusion. So I'm going to try and sort of make it a bit clearer. Uh, and I think one of the ways of doing that is actually to look at the fact that to get your common intention, which is sort of step one, you've got the common intention and detrimental reliance. But on the common intention phase, I think that in itself has a two stage inquiry. And this is what the House of Lords said in, in Rosset, its pre stack case. Um, that was a sole name case. And they said, the first question is, was there a common intention at all that the property should even be shared? And if so, what is the quantification of the shares? And of course, in a joint name case, um, there's still a two stage inquiry, but it's not quite the same because we know, of course, in a joint name case that there is an intention to share because of course the property is in joint names, or at least that's the starting point. And I think this was put, the two-stage inquiry was put quite clearly by Lord Wilson at the end of um, James and Colonel. And he said, the first question in the two-name case is, can the claimant establish a common intention that the shares be in some proportion 
other than joint and equal? And then if so, in what proportion? So in that way, it's the same as the you know, uh, full name case. Right, that's clear. So how does this two-stage inquiry fit within the mantra, which I'm sure is now common in yoga studios uh, up and down the country, about intention, actual, inferred or imputed? I like the idea that people are doing just that. <laughs> or the Dowden. Um, Dowden well, facing dog. Oh, get rid. Make it. Maybe that's what we should be doing, you know, at the, uh, at the start of these sessions, you know, a bit of, a bit of common intention, constructive trust yoga to kind of get some <laughs> <away. laughs> But anyway, so, I mean, very there flexible. Was... Very flexible. <laughs> very good, really. I hope someone else is laughing at our it's not just us. Um, so, there was a reason why I was explaining this two-stage intention, and that's because the mechanism that you're allowed to use depends on whether you're at stage one of the inquiry, and stage two, and there might also be other factors that determine this as I'll go and see. But um, at the first stage of the inquiry, I think the joint judgment by Lord Walker and Lady Hale in Jones and Kernod, you know, the orthodoxy or understanding of that judgment is that at stage one, there are only two permissible routes um, to answer the question, is there, a, um, is there an agreement that the equity shouldn't follow the law? And the first is express discussions, however imprecise or imperfect. And you don't actually need to have an express discussion as to the percentage shares, but just that they will be different. And then the second is inferred agreement. And the court may infer the common intention to be other than joint and equal from the conduct of the parties. And it's at the second stage of the inquiry, once you've got over that first hurdle, that equity doesn't follow the law, only then, and only if, um, and only if you can't get there by way of um, inference, then you're allowed to impute. So you can see that's why you need to be thinking about what stage of the inquiry you're at. Yes, so how do you show that the first element uh, exists? How do you show the common intention? Well, um, Sorry, I'm sort of now. I'm sort of slightly um, Well, I think I think as I said. Um, oh, sorry, just looking at the question. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, I mean, how how what's the difference between imputation and intention? Sorry, I had got distracted by the question. Yeah, so did I. Good question. We'll come back to the questions, and I'm glad the yoga fans are pleasing some people in the audience. Um, Say so, right. So I've just explained that um, you can only use imputation, or at least the orthodoxy is you can only use imputation at stage two. Um, so what's the difference and does it matter? Well, it's a bit of a vexed subject, and I think it's fair to say that different judges take a slightly different view on whether there's a practical difference and quite how you define it. I mean, in terms of the inference, I think Lord Newberger and Stack explain this quite clearly. He said, an inferred intention is one which is objectively deduced to be the subjective actual intention of the parties in light of their actions and statements. So I was thinking about this, I mean, I suppose, if, Ruth and I, if we bought a house, but you paid all the money and did all the DIY and I didn't even bother to turn up. Um, it may be that, um, so I'm going to move the <laughs> chat system. <laughs> it may be that the house would fall down if you let all the DIY to me, Eliza. <laughs> Well, anyway, if, you know, I might think in my mind the house, you know, is mine, but someone looking objectively at that conduct might deduce that our subjective joint intention is that Ruth owns the house, but Ruth owns more. Whereas I think that it was Lord Wilson in uh, Jones and Kernot who explains imputation quite well, and he, he took this really from Oxley and Hiscock. He said that the notion of imputing an intention is that in the final analysis, the exercise is wholly unrelated to the ascertainment of the party's views. It involves the court deciding what is fair in light of the whole course, course of dealing with the property. So, you know, in, in, you know uh, there is some debate here, but in ballpark terms, the way I see the difference is with inference, you're still looking for what the actual agreement was. It's just an actual agreement that wasn't expressed orally. Whereas imputation is more of a sort of broad brush, let's look at what is fair, even if the parties never informed an intention in their mind. So um, is it possible to ever impute an intention at stage one, Eliza? 
Well, uh, good question. I mean, as I've been saying, the orthodoxy is no, 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 no. There's plenty of court of appeal authority that says no. Uh, for example, Cape Horn and Harris. But I want to look a bit more closely at this because Lord Wilson says something very interesting at the end of uh, James and Kernot. He says, before us is a case in which Judge Denham, the trial judge, found and was entitled to find on the evidence, the common intention required by the first question could be inferred. So this is a joint name case, so we've got a presumption of a beneficial joint tenancy, and it was the conduct of the parties that meant that the trial judge could find that uh, he could infer from the conduct that the beneficial ownership was to be other than um, equal shares. And so Lord Wilson goes on to say, does the question, does the case does not require us to consider whether modern equity allows the intention required by the first question also to be imputed if it is not otherwise identifiable? That question will merit careful thought. And so in light of that, I went back and I reread what Hale and Walker had said. And it's it was quite a joint judgment, wasn't it, Eliza? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a joint judgment. And they say, they refer to what Newberger says in Stack about um, inference and imputation, and they say in deference to him and some other judges' views, that in effect they're saying the general rule or what you should be striving to do always is to ascertain the party's actual intentions, whether you get their free express agreement or it's inferred. But they say there's at least two exceptions in this general area when the court can impute. And I say the first exception is actually the classical resulting trust. Uh, and you know, I wouldn't have necessarily thought about it like that, um, but they're saying that the court is imputing to the parties in the classic resulting trust scenario that they would want the beneficial shares to reflect the actual, say, money that they've contributed, even if the parties never actually thought that. So that's why they call that an imputation. And then they say the second exception is where we're at stage two of the inquiry, where it's impossible to infer a common intention. And it's that second part that was an issue in, um, in Jones and Kernod. If you look at their language, they're saying at least two exceptions exist where the court's allowed to impute. What they don't say is those are the only exceptions. So I think that um, Lord Wilson's right and that they have left the door open for imputation to be used at the first stage. And I, I think personally that there's nothing in that judgment which makes us think that that could never happen for a sole name case. But I, I should say that there is no positive authority to that effect. I think that because of the number of court of appeal cases that have said no, 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 it would have to go to the Supreme Court. So not the case now, but I think certainly a door that might be opened in the future and something worth thinking about. That's really interesting, thinking about the presumption of resulting trust as an imputation. I'm not sure I would naturally have thought about it. No, like that. no. But does it actually make any difference if you can impute a common intention at the first stage, Eliza? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it does remind me very much of my philosophy days. Um, you know, this imputation inference, what's the real difference? I mean, Lord Collins, I think, is a bit of that view in James and Kernock, because he said, oh, you know, the difference will hardly ever matter. I'm not sure I agree then. It does, it does depend to some extent exactly how you're thinking about inference versus imputation. But if you're using that framework I referred to earlier on, um, then I think it can do. So I'll take a, a sole name case, Dobson and Griefe's decision by his honour Judge Matthews in 2018. It's something that Harry Martin from our chambers was involved with. And this is a claim by a former cohabitant for an interest in the proceeds of sale of a farm, and that was either by way of proprietary estoppel or a common intention constructive trust. And his Honour Judge Matthews accepted that the claimant had done a great deal of heavy and laborious work during this period, and she'd also given up her job. But um, the key thing is, she had made no financial contributions. I think it's generally accepted that without financial contributions, it's hard, but especially in a sole name case. He said that he didn't accept that the non-financial contributions could give rise to an inference that the property was to be shared. He said this, her labor and commitment were understandable in the context of the relationship and their intended long-term future together with children. That was to be their home, 
and that of her children. It's unnecessary to suppose some sort of quasi-commercial bargain between them to explain it. And he come to that decision, he was relying on, for example, Court of Appeal Authority from Morris and Morris that had said things on a similar line. So I think that, I mean, the point is, if you are in a sort of loving relationship and you're intending on building a, a home in the wide sense together with children and so on, then, and you haven't con contributed financially, then your work and effort is to be attributed to the relationship, not to gaining a beneficial interest in the property. And I think that because of the Court of Appeal Authority, that's probably, and, and because there is this idea that it's harder with a, a sole name, you know, I can well imagine that this continues to be followed. So, you know, let's imagine we've got a case of similar facts. I mean, let's make it a 40 year relationship, not a seven year relationship. And let's say for some reason, proprietary estoppel is not possible. You just don't have the representation, say. Um, well, I think that what might well happen in that kind of scenario is, you know, the trial judge says, no, you know, I can't infer, and you know, no express um, agreement either. So we're not even over that first hurdle, out. Um, and then if, you know, this, if this gets appealed up to the Supreme Court, then I think where it could make a difference is if the Supreme Court kind of looked back at James and Kent and said, well, we didn't rule it out, this imputation. And that this is a case that merits the imputation approach so that the course can look, court can look at the whole course of dealing of the parties and what would be fair. Because you might think that after, you know, 40 years, you know, if you can't, especially if you can't make out a proprietary estoppel of effort, that the fair way of going ahead would be to say that the parties had a common intention that can be imputed, that they were to share it. I mean, of course, you know, and I mean, this is, I'm, this is just an example. I mean, there, there are, of course, policy reasons against this. I mean, it, you know, why have a presumption if the court can just come in and change it? And also policy reasons of fairness. And of course, this is not the law yet, but I think it's a really interesting issue. And that's just an example of why I think imputation could make a difference, especially in a sole name case where there are no financial contributions. All right, that is really interesting, Eliza. But can you have a common intention constructive trust in the commercial context? We've been talking about people's homes. Well, that's an interesting question. And I think in a way it kind of got harder for a while before it got you know, a bit more clearer because the, again, the orthodoxy, we had Stack and Dowden in 2007 and Lasker and Lasker in 2008. And the idea was in the domestic context, you have the nice, friendly, uh, common intention constructive trust. Whereas in the commercial context or the non-domestic context, as in Lasker, which was an investment property, you have what Hale actually referred to as the mercenary approach of the um, resulting trust. And I think the reason she was calling it a mercenary approach is, of course, from the context of a sort of established cohabiting personal relationship, you might think it's a bit of a it's antagonistic to the very nature of that relationship if you start counting your contributions. Um, whereas I suppose the idea is in a commercial context that makes a, a lot more sense. So that was, that was the picture. Then we have Marr and Colley, decision of the Privy Council, um, or advice of the Privy Council in 2017. That's when it got a bit more complicated, I thought. Because Lord Kerr said this, a simplistic answer to the uh, question that Reith asked, might be that if the property is purchased in joint names by parties in a domestic relationship, the presumption of joint beneficial ownership applies. But if brought in a wholly non-domestic situation, it does not. In the latter case, it might be said that the resulting trust presumption applies. The board considers that save perhaps where there is no evidence from which the party's intentions can be identified, that's imputation, the answer is not to be provided by the triumph of one presumption over the other. In this, as so many areas of law, context counts for everything. It well, if not everything, a lot. And context here is set by the party's common intention or the lack of it. And I, you know, I was a bit baffled by this, and I was, um, you know, sort of researching this, and I found a good blog placed by Brian Slane. I think he's a friend of yours, isn't he, Reese? Right. But um, anyway, he said. I think, you know, that this is all quite confusing or at least a bit of a mess because how does this make any sense? So, you know, you've got a client who comes through the door and there is obviously some form of common intention, constructive trust or estoppel claim or resulting trust. And there are, and you know, obviously different principles apply and your client is asking you, right, well, um, 
you know, maybe it's a sort of quasi commercial situation, you know, well, you know, wh which route is it and you know, what sort of evidence and so what procedures are you going down? And um, you say, well, it all depends on intention. And, um, and then intention as to not only which type of trust applies, but also if you then get into the common intention constructive trust, you know, what is your common intention? It's just kind of baffling, really. I don't, you know, I thought it, I didn't make, it didn't make much sense to me. And interestingly, uh, it hasn't really been picked up on by cases since then. Unfortunately, We've got the case that I referred to earlier on of uh, Carmen and Harrison Morgan decision of, from autumn last year by Lord Justice Henderson in the Court of Appeal. Actually, Penny, um, was it Penny and Luke Ruth who were involved in this, I think? Oh, she's frozen. Yeah, that's right, Penny and Luke. Yeah. Um, well, one of the issues that came up was whether in this at least um, mostly commercial context um, whether a common intention constructive trust could apply and I mean the background facts are quite complicated but basically there are two business partners and these business partners were neighbours the various properties and one of the properties was actually also owned as a home um, by one of the business partners so it wasn't a hundred percent of a commercial context but it was large predominantly commercial with these business partners and um, what Lord Justice Henderson said is, I do not doubt that special considerations apply to the purchase of a home by cohabiting parties, and I think what he means there, you know, personal inter intimate relationship parties, but my analysis in the present case does not depend on any special features of such cases. The common understanding between the parties was a matter of express agreement between them, and then he said on the strength of that express agreement, he could infer the existence of a similar understanding in respect to other aspects of the case. And then he said this, that is very different from the inference or imputation of a common intention respectively ascertained by examination of the whole course of conduct between cohabiting parties over many years of the kind now routinely undertaken by courts in a domestic context. And then he went on to uh, cite Lewin, he said there's no reason why constructive trust of a traditional kind, i.e. where you've got um, agreement, may not rise in a commercial context. And so I, I was interested by that because that's actually also quite similar to the approach of Chief Master Marsh in the first round of Bazzati that I mentioned earlier on, where he said express agreement fine for intestacy beneficiaries or at least these intestacy beneficiaries but i'm not going to go down the whole um looking into the whole course of dealing between these parties because they're not in a domestic relationship so i suppose one way and perhaps a clearer way of approaching the question of what, what do we do if it's commercial is i think perhaps there are two extremes if we've got the intimate personal relationship it's absolutely clear, I think, that you are allowed to, um, the court is allowed to infer an, an actual agreement on the basis of that course of conduct. And of course, I've got my arguments about imputation, but we'll leave them to a side at the moment. And if you've got an absolute pure commercial situation, then perhaps you can get a common intention constructive trust rather than a resulting trust, but it will be on the basis of an express agreement. And then perhaps maybe in the middle, that's where it gets difficult. What if you've got mother and son or colleagues? Um, must, must look into that holiday house, Ruth. <laughs> it's all mine. <laughs> and you all heard that, it's all mine. No, um, no and you know, you've in these sort of midway points, I mean, what do we do then? I mean, how much, how much can we look at? And that's actually also an issue in soul name cases, because in stack, um, Baroness Hale gave this really long list of paragraph 69 of all the um, considerations you can take into account when you're inferring and looking at the whole course of dealing. But there is uh, some suggestion that that list is more constrained for sole name cases, but how constrained we don't know. Um, so there we go. I think that's my sort of taxonomy um, in a nutshell of common intention constructive trusts, at least some of the issues. Yeah, so um, what about pr more practical issues, uh, Eliza? Do you have uh, any practical points you want to share? It sounds like a living together agreement uh, is a very good idea if uh, anyone's coming uh, to your house. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I definitely think that's a good idea. And one thing that we were discussing earlier, Reith, is that um, the TR1 form has a box. Well, you know, you can tick which boxes. So you can say, 
um, you know, if it's a joint ownership, um, whether it's um, joint tenancy, tenants in common, if so, which shares. And it's amazing that the number of cases where, for example, people don't tick it at all, or they tick more than one box, or they tick the box that says equal shares, but then say 80, 70. Um, I mean, I really don't know if you have any thoughts about, you know, that. Well, I think it, I know that the land registry uh, got some uh, advice about their forms and things like that. I think it was impossible to get a kind of computer says no problem for people who want to register property in joint names. So they actually have to properly complete that box. That probably still wouldn't stop them ticking more than one box. But I think that that could prevent difficulties. My feeling is that this is partly uh, driven by the fact that despite the fact that a house is likely to be the most expensive purchase uh, of your life, um, people are very unwilling to pay for legal advice uh, at that stage. I mean, they do get conveyances because they can't do the conveyancing, but often the conveyances will represent both parties and they're not in therefore a position to give adequate advice about the uh, putting in place a trust um, mm -hmm. over the property. Um, and I think that um, in general, it would be better if people were more willing to invest a little bit more money in their uh, mm -hmm. large purchase. And it would certainly save uh, a great deal of uh, money down the road in terms of a dispute. If, because although, um, as I understand uh, it, um, a declaration of trust isn't uh, incapable of being altered by way of uh, additional common intention, constructive trust or proprietary estoppel, the evidential weight that will be given to the written agreement is very high indeed so um that's a, a relevant point what about uh, 75 act claims any pr practical points on common intention and constructive trust in the context of those claims eliza well i have found sometimes that if you're a cohabitant 75 act um claimant then you've you know people have also brought their common intention constructive trust claim and i do find um sometimes that can cause quite a lot of tension in the evidence i mean it's certainly not impossible but you've got to think about it quite carefully because under the 75 act you're trying to say look you know that this you know the deceased kind of supported me and we had this relationship together and my you know i can't do it by myself and you know this should be continued or you might be saying relying on as a backup maintenance so you're saying all that sort of thing and yet in the um, common intention constructive trust context, you're trying to say, no, I'm actually an owner, and um, you know, I did all of, you know, I did all of this to actually give myself beneficial interest. So, I, I you know, and I, actually, as we were talking about earlier, Ruth, it can also cause practical problems about kind of what is the value of the estate. So, um, you know, I would just think carefully about combining those two, and that can and can impact on the inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually have one of these um, 75 Act Common Intention Constructive Trusts cases starting uh, together um, at the moment. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. What about if you're a personal representative? How do you deal with it if someone makes that claim uh, to a uh, Common Intention uh, Constructive Trust? Or what if you're a PR and you think that you've got a Common Intention Constructive Trust claim yourself? <laughs> That's particularly complicated, but I think you know, this actually arises quite often. Um, you know, you might have a completely professional, neutral, independent PR who has no idea of you know the course of dealing between the parties. Um, I mean, certainly in a case I had recently, uh, the, you know, I think the starting point is just to write to the you know, would-be owner and say what what is your evidence? Because sometimes I find it is a bit of a try on and people are just saying well you know what is what is this pr no um so they just assert it and then they can't substantiate it at all so that's one way out um i also find that they're often in possession um of the property so what you could do i think is uh serve a notice to quit and then bring possession proceedings under part 55. Now, I think sometimes people think it's just under Talata, but for an order for sale, but actually section 18 of Talata says that section 14 doesn't apply to PRs. So it's under the ordinary possession claim. And then of course, what the uh, defendant can do is assert a common intention constructed trust, proprietary estoppel, 75 act, um, and, and you know, get the possession proceedings stayed, but at least you kind of then got it out. Um, it's also worth noting that the practice direction 51Z at the moment means that you can't bring possession proceedings under part 55 um, until I think October 20th at least. You can though 
uh, bring your normal order for sale. So just as an aside, I think those are the practical points. I think Ruth, we had some, we have some questions. We have some questions. We've got some questions from the legal academics. It turns out Brian's here. Hi, Brian. Hi, Brian. Um, <laughs> um, but Claire Michelle Smith has been asking us some questions. And the first question uh, related to, um, uh, I think it was uh, really about whether detriment sort of going forward uh, could be uh, relied on in favour of a person claiming a common intention constructive trust. So um, it's definitely the case that uh, in matrimonial uh, proceedings, um, the sort of uh, compensation is a theory uh, in which uh, you can uh, get a different share of the uh, joint matrimonial assets because you'll look at needs, compensation and sharing. So if one party to the um, uh, marriage has, for example, given up uh, a lucrative uh, career as a legal academic, and decided to look after the children uh, and the other party has continued with their um, job, you'll look to uh, potentially adjust the shares of the assets going forward to take into account that uh, compensation is needed for the fact that one party has um, given up um, part of their career for that. And that's also perhaps, although I know a bit less about this, uh, what can happen where there's a claim under the Children Act? Because certainly while the children are uh, in need of accommodation during their uh, education, um, they will be provided with uh, a likely a property if there's, uh, if there's need for it. And that might uh, assist someone who has um, as is a, a parent of the children that's given up their job, but it won't be a long-term solution for him or her, although it's normally a her. Um, and the, I think the question is whether you could use those kind of arguments to um, support a uh, common intention constructive trust where there's a less um, orthodox uh, detriment. And my feeling is that it would be at at the moment very hard to do so unless you could really um, uh, connect the agreement uh, to, to have a property together, the common intention with the uh, uh, agreement to perhaps look after the children more for one party and the other party uh, concentrate on perhaps his career. I think that if uh, you know we we'll had we uh, we sat down. Um, I'm concerned my uh, uh, connection might become unstable again. I'm sorry about that. I don't know why it's like that today. If you ended up in a situation where uh, I, I said, oh, "Well, to to uh, my my putative partner, well, you." Uh, come and live in my house and I'll carry on with my career and you look after the children and we can um, we can make that work as an arrangement and because I'm allowing you to live in my house uh, and I agree to support you if you have really clear um, agreements in that kind I, I think the court might take them into account but I think that the uh, um, Eliza was talking about the uh, decision uh, in of, Mr. of Lord Justice Lewison, where he particularly looks at the the detriment and the unconscionability, and that does look to be more um, backward looking. You might find actually that conceptually it's easier to make those kind of detriment going forward arguments in a proprietary estoppel claim, which are similar but different to common intention constructive trust statements, because we know that. Um, the, there's, a, there's arguably a bit more flexibility in the way that the court looks at uh, satisfying the equity and um, in uh, Thorner and Major, the House of Lords specifically said that the owl of Minerva flies only at the um, calling of the dusk. So you're looking forward and backwards. And I suppose you could use that kind of argument to say that there's some forward looking basis. But I think it's but I think because of that, it'd be easier in proprietary estoppel than in common intention constructive trusts. I'm afraid I haven't really thought a great deal about that um, before, but that's my view sort of a bit on the fly. I don't know if you want to add to that, Eliza. 
Well, I, was just gonna say, I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think probably at the moment, at least, we're stuck with the orthodoxy, it's, you know, of the detrimental reliance. But, you know, as I was trying to explore this idea of whether the courts are going to further develop these principles, you know, bring in the imputation, for example, at the first stage, and, you know, possibly, you know, maybe 10 years down the line, um, if the courts are taking a more flexible approach, then possibly at that stage, um, you know, then maybe it's, it's, it becomes easier then to get rid of detrimental reliance. I'm sure lots of people are saying, oh God, no, um, you know, the horror of the property lawyers. I and mean, I think I'm right, in, um, Patrick, tell me if um, someone in the audience can tell me, but I think the basis of the cohabitation bill has this idea of, um, a relationship incurred in, um, detriment. So perhaps that, in some extent, uh, the bill is, um, which was based on the Law Commission report, is picking up on this idea of vulnerability, but it doesn't have much um, support, unfortunately, I think. Um, and actually, when I, when I was studying family law with Brian Sloan, amongst other people, I mean, one of the things I thought was, and Joe Miles and people like that, you know, we looked at some of the, um, you know, the research and um, where, you know, they ask cohabitants and it's amazing how few of them know the law. A staggering number of people think there's a common law marriage. It's like 50 percent. I mean, I don't know where these people are. It's, it's horrifying. And so many people are not getting married, not, you know, because of the cost of it. Or because they don't understand their rights. So this idea that you know we need to protect people's freedoms is a bit misconceived if they already think that they've got these rights. Um, yeah, I do often get claims from people who say, "Yeah, well, he he was my common law husband, so surely there's no problem here." I mean, that's before you even start to think about the inheritance tax. But then we've got another question from Claire Michelle Smith, which is about the weight to be given to a cohabitation agreement and whether it's flexible, and if uh, a long time had passed, whether uh, circumstances had changed drastically from the agreement, would the court? Um, um, deal with it flexibly and the answer to this is that it's going to slightly depend on the terms of the agreement I would suggest but it's not like a prenuptial or postnuptial agreement where sort of the more time that has elapsed since it the less weight the court might uh, give to it um, although I'm not uh, suggesting that I am an expert on prenup agreements um, but if for example I own uh, my house and uh, I, um, my uh, boyfriend, he moves in and our living together agreement says that uh, he is going to pay a bit of his share of the bills and um, some rent to me and he's not going to get an interest in the property. I don't think how, as if that's the uh, sole basis of our uh, cohabitation, then I don't think that that's likely to be treated in any way flexibly by the court at all. Um, I think it is possible, uh, for example, if uh, for our agreement to be overtaken by a common intention between uh, the two parties. Now, I can't remember the name of the case, but there's a decision of Mr. Justice Mann uh, where he uh, suggests that that's the case. Um, I guess that'd be sort of, I mean, I think it's also in um, Jones and Kerr, not the kind of the idea. Yeah regulatory trust and and I guess also it depends you know how I mean certainly I think how that whether the circumstances have changed uh, dramatically makes a real difference because I mean if you if you did your cohabitation agreement now and yet you know in 20 years time you've got children say one of them's disabled you know who knows what's happened in the meantime I mean those kind of I think those kind of drastic changes you know could make all the difference um, I think what you need is some evidence of me saying actually like notwithstanding the uh, cohabitation agreement uh, this is going to be your house I think you are going to have I mean it's going to be much more difficult and I think you're going to want much more clear uh, representations than you might have if you don't have the living together agreement um, that's my view anyway um, I also think that Part of the, I, I, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily agree with Eliza on uh, how she thinks the law ought to develop statutorily because uh, I do think that it would be, uh, if the problem is that people don't understand their rights, there ought to be an education programme and I've long thought that actually the um, citizenship and that kind of aspect of um, education in um, 
uh, schools is lacking because they don't teach um, kids really what a mortgage is what renting is what their rights as uh, tenants might be and what their rights um in the family might be i mean there's just nothing uh what their right as a parent would be so i think that it would be better to educate people what their rights actually are rather than necessarily cause them to obtain additional rights they won't know about or won't know that they're sort of giving up over their property but, i think um, i mean the way the bill is um developed is that um there's an opt out so i would you, you would then the idea is for those kind of more um on the ball um you know couples who are aware of their rights they can opt out whereas what you're doing is um helping those who um don't understand and i think that you know i don't think an education program would reach ev you know everyone i mean it's staggering I, I repeat this but staggering that 50 about 50 percent of people think there's a common law marriage um this is actually because of tabloid newspapers that needed a way to refer to people's uh, sort of, well, what you would call a common law partner. Yeah, I think there has been a sort of attempt at re-education and it's got nowhere. Um, but Brian Sloan is saying something interesting, He's saying the problem is that any express declaration of trust, this is going back to the debate about um, cohabitation agreements, um, is essentially conclusive, but there is a suggestion that an estoppel might nevertheless work in those circumstances. Yeah, I mean, they, they say that in stack. I mean, it's very, very difficult if you, as you said as well, Ruth, if you've got that express declaration of trust. Um, uh, but yeah, estoppel, so estoppel is a friend of the common intention of constructive trust and I think in practical sense, plead them as alternatives. Well, uh, uh, thanks to everybody for all the questions. And if you are waiting still for me to answer your question from last week, uh, the questions were difficult inheritance tax questions. And I've had a very busy week, so I'm sorry I haven't replied to everybody yet, but I will do so. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. Next Monday, we have an exciting judicial review uh, webinar um, with uh to do with tax judicial review we're not just uh, going off and starting becoming a public law set uh with amanda hardy qc oliver marr and sam chandler and i'll definitely be tuning in to that at midday on monday um and thanks eliza for answering all my questions and some from the legal academics too I mean, I, that's, it's made a real difference actually to have some questions. It makes it much more interactive. So everybody, I do encourage you to ask questions. Ask terribly difficult questions on Monday. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> like and what is judicial will, review? <laughs> and Ruth and I will be developing the Stack and Dowd and Jaeger. So you'll yeah. see that next time. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks everybody and see you next time on uh, Five Stone Buildings webinars. Bye. <laughs>